Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. My name is Patrick Moran. Big, big thank you to everyone out there as always for watching, for listening, for following, for subscribing. I appreciate you guys very, very much. You're the best. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by Sunny Reds. Sunny Lackawanna, just minutes away from Highmark Stadium on Abbott Road. And if you follow this show, you already know what I think about Sunny Reds. Quite possibly the single most underrated place in all of Western New York to go eat. The wings are incredible. Mount Rushmore worthy. Brick oven pizza, amazing. Fish fries, awesome. There's so many great things about that place. Plus the vibe, the ambiance. I love every single thing about Sunny Reds. They are a big supporter of the show. So make sure that you guys go out there and support them. As for today's episode, I had something else in the works. I'll be completely honest with you, but it kind of fell through last second. So I decided that today would be an excellent opportunity, especially with the Bills on a bye week to have one of our uh, pod bag episodes. These are the episodes where you control the narrative of the show. Your topics, your questions, your comments, your takes. I'm going to read them off. I'm going to reply to them. Some of these I got from Facebook, some from Twitter, a couple from Blue Sky. I am on Blue Sky as well now. Of course, email as always. And this is a very Bills-centric uh, pie bag here today. So pretty much everything we're talking about are, are the Buffalo Bills. I feel like I have to say that because on the YouTube side, I've been getting a couple comments recently. I feel like I got to address this like once a week now on this show. But this is Talking Buffalo. This is not Talking Buffalo Bills. I love Talking Buffalo Bills. I'm not naive. I know the Bills is where my bread is buttered with the audience. But sometimes we do talk about other things, whether it's the Sabres, whether it's UB whether it's a, a news media member, entertainment, all kinds of things that I like to do from time to time. But if you're not a Bills fan, or I should say if you are a Bills fan and you don't give a shit about any of the other stuff, well, you're in luck today because pretty much this entire pod bag is all Buffalo Bills related. Kind of focused on a premise for this episode that stats really aren't telling the whole story with the Buffalo Bills this season. This is a team that's 9-2, uh, they're currently the number two seed in the AFC. They are literally running away with the AFC East, but they're not doing it with a ton of statistical dominance. And there's a couple questions and takes in this pod bag to kind of allude to that. So uh, I will be addressing that on today's show, which by the way, that game on Sunday, 31.2 million people tuned in and watch that game on CBS. That is just mind blowing. That's incredible. In fact, for CBS, that is their highest rated non Thanksgiving or Christmas CBS football telecast since 2007. The good old days of Tom Brady versus Peyton Manning. Many people say Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes is the modern day. Um, Brady versus Manning and fans certainly agree because 31.2 million people watch that. That is just uh, absolutely insane. One other quick piece of actual Bill's news. I'm recording this Wednesday around dinner time-ish. So late afternoon, very early evening. Uh, Terrell Bernard was named AFC Defensive Player of the Week. And that's incredible. First of all, he it, it deserved it. Eight tackles, um, an interception to put the game away. A sack in the first quarter. He was all over the place making plays. Um, if you're a Bills fan, you come to expect that when he's in the lineup. But the cool thing about that is he becomes the sixth player for the Buffalo Bills this season to win AFC Player of the Week, whether it's offense, defense, or special teams. Three different guys now have won it on the defensive side. So 
pretty incredible. And there's still plenty of games left. I, I think I saw Sal Capaccio put out a tweet earlier. This has been done six times, a handful of times, including just last year. But I think seven might be the team record. So we'll see. Again, they still got six games out there for somebody to get player of the week and, and, and kind of uh, and break that record for the Bills. But anyway, on to this mailbag. And this is a good one, too. Lots of really good comments, at least I think anyway. Um, we'll start with a regular to the show, at least on the YouTube side anyway, Maz Vids. And he says, isn't it wild that Josh Allen is having his best chance at an MVP of his career without the gaudy numbers, without being the leading rusher, without the 50-yard passes every other play, without hurdling linebackers? Geez, it's almost like the most important part of playing quarterback is protecting the ball and elite decision-making. Hmm, who would have thought? It's great to see Allen actually playing quarterback from the neck up. This is a team that can win the Super Bowl. And again, that's from Maz Vids. Thank you for that. And I'll tell you, if you follow us on the YouTube side, the video side anyway, and if you kind of go through the comments, Maz has a very love-hate relationship with Josh Allen. So if you know him, coming from him, a pretty damn good compliment about Josh Allen. And I very largely agree with that. Statistically, again, like I said at the very beginning, not even close to the best he's done statistically throughout his career. In fact, it's kind of trending and pacing towards the low end of it. As of right now, he's only got 2,543 yards passing, 18 touchdowns, five interceptions. That's big, only five interceptions. Um, on the ground, 318 yards rushing, five touchdowns. So right now he's got a 23 to six turnover ratio. He did lose a fumble uh, in the first quarter of the first game this year. Hasn't lost one since. So 23 touchdowns he's accounted for and six turnovers. You go back to last year, threw for a lot more yards, threw for a lot more touchdowns, but he also threw for a lot more interceptions, like a 44 to like 20 ratio last year between interceptions and, and lost fumbles. So yes, he is playing a lot smarter this year. He has been much more consistent. He is consistently taking what the defense is offering to give him. And he's done it for the most part masterfully. I'd say the only game, the Bills have played 11 games. Obviously they got nine wins. And I'm not going to hold the Baltimore game against Josh Allen whatsoever. That was a team ass whooping. They went to Baltimore and the Ravens just whooped the Bills ass. Guy one through 46, 47, however the hell many guys dressed on that day for the Bills. Both sides of the football, special teams, coaching. It was a thorough ass whooping. The Bills did not lose that game because Josh Allen won any good. They lost a game because they just got their asses beat. Following week in Houston, kind of a different story. Certainly injuries and have been a factor for the Bills for most this season. But you could make a case that that Houston game, uh, even though I don't think he threw an interception in a game, but he stunk. Josh Allen did not play well. He was terrible. He was 9 for 30 that game. Um, inaccurate all over the place again. Kind of to be expected when Matt Collins is your wide receiver number one for that game. He was their best receiver available. Um, or at least he got the most targets that game. That's going to be what you get. But anyway, Josh in that game, in that Houston game, he did not help his team. He was as much uh, a part of the problem as he was the solution. But that game aside, where Josh was really bad, um, I think he's played well in all 10 games, some better than others, but I can't sit here and tell you that Josh Allen has had more than one really bad game this entire season where he was just forcing things and he could have had three or four turnovers easily that game against Houston. And he only lost by a field goal, but that to me was still, and I've said this, that was a combination of Nico Collins getting hurt literally on the play where he gets behind the Bills defenders for a 77 yard bomb or whatever the hell it was gets hurt on the play that Houston took their foot off the gas, got a little bit too comfortable. And the Bills defense made a few plays in the second half and made a game of it. But anyway, Josh was lousy that game. That aside, Josh Allen has been 
one of, if not the best player on the field for both teams every single week. And sure, like I said, conservative, taking what they're giving them, using the check down, throwing the ball away, not looking to run too quick, being patient, being poised, not getting rattled when things aren't going his way. Those have been traits mentally that Josh Allen has been better at than ever. But it's also not like, you know, he's not like Alex Smith. He's not Trent Edwards. He's not Tyrod Taylor. It's not, he's not a system quarterback either. Even amidst, you know, kind of a, a subpar statistical season or, you know, a highlight real season, he still has plenty of those, actually. I mean, obviously, the touchdown this past Sunday, that's, you know, when you put out the Josh Allen deserves MVP highlight reel, that's going to lead off, and it should. It was an incredible run um, in the biggest moment of a game against the two-time defending Super Bowl champions. That play was amazing. But that's not the only, like, holy shit, oh, my God, Josh Allen just did that moment. There's been plenty of them this season. Um, the Jets game, Monday Night Football, Michael Clemens is rushing the passer and somehow Josh weaves his way literally in between Deion Dawkins and Clemens, rolls out to the left on the run and finds Dawson Knox in the end zone for a touchdown. That was crazy. Uh, you had that wild scramble when he went, rolled to the right against Jacksonville and he fouled Dalton Kincaid coming across in the end zone for a touchdown. Again, on Monday Night Football, a couple of weeks ago in Miami, near the end of the first half, looked like he was going to get sacked. He's rolling out. And just before he gets to the sidelines, he crosses the line on the run. A, a great throw to Matt Collins, 44 yards, sets up a field goal. Again, a couple of great runs, a couple of sideline tippy toe throws, which he's, you know, that's kind of the norm for him at this point. So look, he's been plenty spectacular at times. But yes, the difference, I think this is what Maz is getting at here, is he is. Come, if he hasn't done it completely, he's come as close as he probably ever will come to putting the game completely together mentally. He just feels mentally smarter out there than he ever has. And to be able to do that without the physical skills eroding is probably the reason why you can make a case, at least make a case, that Josh Allen might be the best player in football right now, period. You put the mental um, intelligence with the physical capabilities and you got a guy who is capable of being unstoppable. And the last point on that too, I think comfort is a huge deal. I think this season, Josh Allen is just more comfortable than he's ever been. More calm. I think he's enjoying the season a lot. Maybe, you know, you can make, some people certainly are going to conclude that Stefan Diggs not being here has helped Josh Allen when it comes to that. Um, I think there's some truth to that. I don't think that's the whole story, but I would also say that maybe he's, you know, had so much pressure on him for so many years now because of his talents and expectations that he's gotten used to handle it. Like it's not bothering him anymore. Maybe it's, uh, the happiness in his love life off the field. Lots of reasons, but Josh Allen just looks way more comfortable than he's ever looked to me anyway in his career. And certainly uh, it's showing. At Brian P 150H says, in my mind, that game, talk about last week, was Josh Allen's signature win, like Jim Kelly diving into the end zone versus Miami in the 1989 opener. Finally, a win in a game that he did something extraordinary, at least in my opinion. All right, I really didn't have the time or the energy to kind of dig into Josh Allen's career and try to figure out which one of these highlight plays, these great moments actually came in a, in a win or came at a critical part of a Bills victory. I don't know that. So I'm not going to sit there and debate, you know, the merits of, if he finally did something extraordinary in a big moment. Um, but I will say is if you're a younger Bills fan or hell, even if you're older and, and you just forgot, uh, this question, or I shouldn't say this question, this take from Brian kind of got the juices flowing, tried to get me to remember that game back in 1989. Bills, Dolphins, 
uh, the Marino Kelly rivalry. And I went back and I looked at it on YouTube and it, it hit me there. I remember it. I saw the plays like, Holy shit. Uh, what Brian's referring to is 1989, uh, the bills opening game. They were at Miami and the bills were down 24 to 20 with two seconds left in the game. So one play left in the game. They're at the three yard line. A field goal is not going to, you know, send it to overtime. They're down four. They need a touchdown. So one play left, ball at the three. And Jim Kelly takes the snap from the shotgun and runs left and, and plummets literally into the end zone for a touchdown. Now, Josh Allen doing that, you would expect it. Jim Kelly, if you watch the Bills during the Jim Kelly days, Jim slings the ball all over the place. Sometimes it was good. Once in a while, it was bad, but he was a gunslinger. He was not much of a running quarterback. But in this case, and it was a design play, he took that snap from the shotgun, and he was running the entire time. Ken Hull, Jim Richter had great blocks on uh, the nose guard. Uh, the right defensive end was kind of rushing uphill. Will Wolford had him. Jim saw that little crease. And... <laughs> Not the fastest dude, Jim Kelly, but he dove for that end zone and he got in. It was a huge play. If my memory serves me correct, I can't remember if they came after they lost to Cincinnati the season before in the AFC Championship or if that was the year where Ronnie Harmon had to drop and, and then Matthews had the interception. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But I do know, again, it was the, the first game of the year and it was the first game of the year that started what would become the Bills Super Bowl run where they went to four consecutive Super Bowls. That was the catalyst and, and that was the play. So by the way, if you want to see that play, you want to see that moment, if you either have never seen it or you forgot about it or you just want to see it again, you go on YouTube and you just type in Jim Kelly TD run uh, it'll be there for you. I, I found it. It was, it was fun to watch, man. It was a nice little trip down, uh, down memory lane for sure. All right, we'll get to one more before we take a break here. At New Account Signing. I love that name, by the way. New Account Signing. Actually, this was from Reddit. This was from our Reddit page. Um, He says, or she says, I don't know. I've noticed they respect being the Bills. Who's on a roll? Cook just made a monster play. Let's let him carry this drive on his back. Keon Coleman's having a breakout game. Test the limits. Give him that repeat one-on-one -on -one against uh, Tyreek Wooden. Shakir's having success with screens and yak. Keep it going. Mental momentum is so real in football, and it is powerful to realize. I'll tell you what, I really like that take. I do. Um, I think it kind of speaks to, you know, you just ran off in that uh, in that tweet or whatever you want to call it, a handful of players. You, you mentioned Cook. You mentioned Coleman. Uh, you, you mentioned Shakir. And that kind of speaks to that, that everybody eats mentality that the Bills really had this season. And I'll tell you what, too. You want to add other players? Uh, how about Ray Davis? You could add Ray Davis to that, you know, keeping the momentum going. Go back to the Jets game. No James Cook. and. You know, the, the sliding was expected to be tough against the Jets. Really good defense. And Ray Davis steps up and he shoulders the load. 20 carries he had that game for 97 yards, too. I also caught three passes for 55 yards. So he had like 152 yards or something like that in, in yards from scrimmage against the Jets that game. So, sure. I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head. Eh, I really don't know if there's anyone else offensively that has carried him, but yeah, man, like Ty Johnson was doing a good job this past week. Statistically, no, but he was pass blocking well and the Bills trusted him and he had a ton of snaps in that game. James Cook did not have a lot of snaps in that game. So sure, to your point, kind of like the Bills are willing to, to ride the hot hand and do something until you stop it. That's especially the case with Shakir. Like I remember going back to that Tennessee game, I was like, Everyone knows they're going to throw the ball quick and short to Shakir and Tennessee still couldn't, uh, still couldn't stop it. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Anyway, we'll take a real quick break. Come back on the other side. I'm going to flag through 
at least a handful more of these. All right, man, I am back here doing a, a pod bag episode solo. I've been talking for 20 minutes. I, I say this once in a while. My mouth gets dry. I don't know how the hell Joe Marino does this shit. He does it not, he does it twice a day. He's not just got locked on bills. He's got another podcast. So he's doing this twice a day for well over an hour each day. And man, not even just losing your voice. Your lips get dry. It's hard to talk for so long. I just, these guys who are really good at doing solo shows. I mean, I can't tell you, especially since I've been doing more and more of these lately. I can't tell you how much respect um, I have for a lot of these guys. At Smeno2 says this, and he's talking about last Sunday, folks. He says, this is the Bills Super Bowl. That's a dumb take. Just a, it's a dumb take. Was Sunday a statement game? Absolutely. Sure. It was a statement game. Was Sunday... Uh, a validation game, you bet. I think the Bills needed to win that game to kind of validate their season to this point. They came into the game eight and two, but they really didn't beat anybody. You know, Arizona is the only team that had a winning record coming into this game. They lost to Baltimore. They lost to Houston, the two good teams that they played on the schedule previously. So sure, validation, 100%. This was a statement game. This was definitely a validation game. But to say it's the Super Bowl for the Bills, that's just dumb. That's just stupid. The Bills are a very good team. The Bills are contenders. The Bills have been contenders for the past several years. Yes, the Bills have lost to the Kansas City Chiefs three straight times in the playoffs. Those last two playoff losses, the Bills could have easily won. I hate, you know, rehashing, you know, tragic old memories for Bills fans, but you're an all-time iconic Sean McDermott stupidity decision or two away from winning that 13 second game. And the bills were in the lead in the fourth quarter last, uh, last season in the playoffs. And they found a way to lose that game. So just no, it's not the bills. Super Bowl it was an important game. It wasn't just one of 17. And if anyone on the team and they try to treat it that way, that's a lie, but no, that's just dumb. Now, when the Bills were in their drought and the couple times they managed to beat New England, sure, that was their Super Bowl because the Bills weren't going anywhere. The Bills weren't going anywhere. You know, if the, if the New York Giants in two weeks from now play the Detroit Lions and they win, that's the Giants' Super Bowl. The Bills beating anyone in the regular season is not the Super Bowl. The Bills beating anybody in... The wild card or divisional round is not the Bills Super Bowl either because the goal is the Super Bowl and the expectations of the Super Bowl at this point and this team's capable of winning the Super Bowl. So just a just a dumb take. I'm going to assume that that's a Kansas City Chiefs fan who chimed in. Uh, at Filthy Beast 79, I think the bottom line with folks like myself that are still skeptics is why did it take seven years to understand what Sean McDermott has in Josh Allen and put the game in his hands when it matters? And will he continue to do this in the playoffs or freeze up and implode like years past? Um, look, I think there's three keys and we'll get into specific episodes down the road as we get closer to the playoffs. But I think there's three key things with the Bills and how far they go. Health is the obvious one. The Bills have been hit hard already with injuries and the Bills have had some really bad luck with playoff time injuries. Look no further than last year. I don't really need to get into it. So that's one. Number two, you got to hope that Josh Allen continues to play the way he's playing now. Smart football, not giving away possessions, not having stupid turnovers and making big mistakes in the biggest moments. He's playing at an MVP level. You're going to need him to continue to play at an MVP level. And then the third thing I think is to the point here, filthy beast is Sean McDermott. Will he melt down? Will he freeze up? Will he make critical mistakes that cost his team in a playoff game? He has certainly done it in the past. He has certainly done it in the past. Whether it's a moment like the Chiefs game 
whether it's decisions, like somehow, some way you don't have, despite all the injuries, AJ Klein on that field, trying to watch Travis Kelsey last year, those kind of decisions, or in the case of the Cincinnati game, which there are a lot of excuses, you know, a lot of injuries, just a long draining emotional season with DeMar Hamlin stuff, but that team just was not ready to play against the Bengals. They looked like they were done three minutes into that football game. So yeah, Sean McDermott has been great in the regular season, not his best in the playoffs. I feel though, I've said it about this team a couple times. It just feels different to me this season. It feels different with the offense, with Josh, his mindset, his attitude, just the way he looks. And I kind of feel like maybe even going back to last year, the near the end of the season, the whole Tyler Dunn article and all that stuff that followed. I, I think that might've changed Sean a little bit. Maybe not as much last year, but going into this year, he knows this is Josh's team and he's going to live by the sword, die by the sword. At, at least during the regular season, he did that on Sunday. Um, it feels like the obvious move to, to put the game in Josh's hands and say, we're not taking the field goal and let it Patrick Mahomes come down there and beat us. That feels obvious. That said, I don't know that two years ago he makes that decision. He might take those points and say, you know what? Kansas City might drive the ball, but I'm going to trust one of my great defenders to make a play and go win the game that way. But right now, I he's got confidence in his quarterback. I think he's got confidence in himself and he's got confidence in his team. If the Bills go down, I think Sean knows it now. At least I hope he does that. And he's, this team needs to go down with the ball in Josh Allen's hands. At Zuzu4434 says, Matt Milano's big impact return is a myth. Dude hasn't really played in what? Two years? Um, eh. Look, I would say it would be naive to say there's no concerns. Like that would be naive to me. I think you're if you if you say that you're you're kind of turning your head to some potential problems. But I feel confident. I do. I feel confident that's not a homer take. If I didn't, I promise you, I would say as much. I feel confident in Matt Milano. Uh I like that it's an upper body, the injury that he had. It's caused him to miss the whole season so far. I think, I would like to think, and I'm confident that he's in really good shape. I don't think cardio is going to be much of an issue once he gets, you know, some reps, some game reps. I'm sure he's been amping up and working his ass off to, you know, to get ready to get back out there. Um, I think going back to camp, because this was a big, maybe the biggest, Certainly one of the biggest uh, talking points and things to follow with training camp this summer. Thought he started kind of slow. And then I remember, you know, going to practices and keeping notes and talking about it on the show afterwards. He really started to ramp up. Like by the end of training camp, especially those last couple practices, I thought he looked great. Like he played, I remember there was one practice and he was out there for every snap. Every first team rep snap, he was out there for playing full speed. He looked Really, really good. It looked like Matt Milano. My expectation is, look, are you looking for him to come out and, you know, get right back into the lineup and play 100% of the snaps like Terrell Bernard did when he returned this season or when Teron Johnson did after missing a month? No, that's not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. My expectation is they start slow with him, you know, like 30 to maybe 50% of the snaps he'll get in the first few games. Uh, maybe he'll get you know, one out of every two drives or maybe one out of every three drives coming back off the bye against Frisco, maybe going into Detroit after that as well. You know, it's a nice little consolation prize that Dorian Williams has been the starter since week one and he's played well enough that he certainly really hasn't hurt you. Like he, he hasn't made the position look bad. Um, so I think that kind of affords Sean McDermott and Bobby Babbage, the luxury of easing Milano back in. Because again, now at this point, you're, when you're nine and two, that's a lot different than five and six or six and five. When you're fighting tooth and nail for the division, you know you're winning the division. So you kind of get that gives you the luxury of 
taking a guy like Matt Milano and not having to risk him too much too early and letting him ease his way back into the lineup. Look, even if it takes Matt Milano, say, four games to get all the way fully back in, and it takes him to that fourth game. Okay, he plays three games at 30, 40, 50% of the reps. And then that fourth game, he's ready to take off. That's still three games with a, a fully healthy Matt Milano out there every single snap that leaves you and then going into the playoffs. So I think the Bills are in a really good position because of the record and because Dorian Williams is not going to kill you. He hasn't killed you all season that you can ease Milano back. But anyway, to the point, Milano's big impact return being a myth. I, I mean, I completely disagree. I completely disagree. Once he gets back to playing football, this isn't to me, I, maybe you're thinking about Trey White a couple of years ago coming off the ACL or the Achilles. Maybe you're thinking about Vaughn Miller last year coming off his ACL where he was utterly useless and probably didn't even, shouldn't have even been active on game days. I don't think that's the case with Matt Milano because again, it's not his legs that he's working his way back from. And he's an all-pro linebacker. Maybe he won't be an all-pro linebacker quality this season, but shit, man, 80, 85% of what Matt Milano's skill set is is still better than a hell of a lot of linebackers around the league. At South Canadian 1, Teron Johnson's playing some of the best ball of his life. So happy for his success and the teams. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's an impact player. He's an all-pro. He's an all-pro slot corner. He is arguably the best slot corner in the entire NFL. I mean, since he's returned, and he did miss that month, you know, he might have saved that Jets game, that interception in the fourth quarter off Aaron Rodgers was gorgeous. It was beautiful. Gorgeous. A couple of weeks ago, he set the tone right away. You know, if Indy had any thoughts of coming out and starting strong and getting the Bills stressed and worried in Indianapolis, didn't happen. First play of the game, Teron Johnson, big six. So yeah, he's a great player. He's an all pro. He's an impact player. Cam Lewis did an admirable job when Johnson was out, but Teron is just, a whole new level of player. I saw that with Terrell Bernard when he came back too in the lineup over Specter. Hopefully, eventually, Matt Milano, like we just talked about, uh, still to come. At Bills Media 716, we have three very effective running backs right now. Obviously, they take stats away from James Cook, but he bulked up in the offseason, and now on top of being a slashing back, he's running through people, which helps on the goal line. No doubt he's been a better football player this year. Thanks for the take. Couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Throw the stats, like I said, you know, kind of the theme. Stats don't tell the whole story. Yeah, his stats are down. Well, not to touch sounds because he's got 10 of them this year. But rushing yards, pace compared to last year is down. Uh, receptions, receiving yards, yards per carry. They're actually all down compared to last year. But I do think he is not just a better player than last year, but I think he's significantly better because I think you could completely trust him. And he's running harder this season. He's running way harder this season. He's got better contact balance. He's having those, those angry runs. We've seen him a couple times now. Uh, it's just, it's great to see. He's a red zone, red zone threat. I didn't see that coming. You know, this to me was a guy who... You drafted him in the second round, and I was high on him. I was pumped that the Bills took him in round two a couple of years ago. But I'm like, yo, this is a guy who could take a handoff, change the pace guy, take it 60 yards at the house, or even, you know, more regularly, he's a guy who's going to come out of the backfield and he's going to kill you in the passing game. I haven't really seen all that much. Now he's kind of Le'Veon Bell. I've, I, I've used that comparison. So run your ass over. Patient, vision waiting to see that hole, and then, bam, you hit it. You know, there's been a couple of plays where I watch it in real time, and I'm like, last year, he bounces that outside. This year, he's taking one step, planting his foot, and he's going. Like, plays that would have been tackles for a loss or at the line or turning into three, four-yard gains, I think it's been great. Uh, Ten touchdowns, like I said, on the ground. Only Derrick Henry and Jalen Hurts have more touchdowns on the ground than James Cook this year. 
I did have that one bad drop in, uh, in the past game earlier this season, but other than that, he's been fine. Not putting the ball on the ground. Love James Cook. There'll be some weeks where maybe the matchup isn't the best for him. I did have those two touchdowns against the Chiefs, but outside of that, couldn't run the ball. Nobody could run the ball in the Chiefs. They weren't going to allow it. So there'll be some weeks where he's not going to look the best, but all in all, I, I think he's been really good. Certainly better than last year. Dan LaSalle says I'd extend Terrell Bernard before Christian Benford, but I certainly want to keep them both. Well, you and I, Dan, and pretty much every Bills fan, I want them both equally. I know that's a cop-out answer. I know that, but that's my take. And I want to get out of here in a few, but we can, we will dedicate in the future entire episodes to this, but right now I'm going to enjoy the Bills being nine and two. I'm going to enjoy this season. I'm going to start thinking maybe a little bit tomorrow, certainly going into the weekend early next week about the San Francisco 49ers a lot. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time thinking about future contracts and extensions right now. I'm going to save that for the off season. Uh, not just with those two guys, but other guys, Shakir, Groot, uh, probably a handful of others too, that we will definitely, definitely be thinking about long and hard about extensions. At the goodest boy seven says the best current Buffalo bill outside of Josh Terrell Bernard is just about there for me. Well, he's certainly up there. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I'm, I, I can't agree with that, although I love Terrell. Um, it's got to be Groot for me. It has to be Groot. Um, he's been fantastic pretty much. Well, he was the defensive player of the week in week one, and he hasn't fallen off much, if at all, since then. He's been good against the run. He's been brilliant at pressuring the quarterback. He's caused two fumbles. He's got five and a half sacks. He's just been an impactful player almost every game. So I would say Groot is the best non-John John Allen or Josh Allen player. And I also think that Groot is probably the biggest factor after Josh Allen going forward on this team as you hope to see them make a run. If the Bills are going to go anywhere in the playoffs, Greg Rizzo has got to be playing at a level that he's playing at literally right now. Uh, Mike Stetler at bluesky.social. Connor McGovern has been one of the Bills' most pleasant surprises this year. When Morse, Mitch Morse, had been briefly spelled in each of the last few seasons, there was an instant and noticeable drop-off in offensive production and some clunky and awkward snaps. Can't re recall a single instance of that this year. Uh, yeah, Mike, 100%. That's a great take. Connor McGovern was a low-key significant concern for me going into this season. And going back again to training camp, pretty shaky at times. Like there were some issues with snaps, not surprising. He's moving from guard to center. So it's not like it was surprising, but sure. That was a concern of all the Bills players that left that exodus of the core veteran leadership that was either cut or traded or just left as free agents, whatever. Um, Mitch Morris to me, I felt like was the one move that the Bills got wrong. In fact, I've said that. I thought that Mitch Morris was going to be the one that got away, the one that they regret. Has not been the case at all. Connor McGovern has been perfectly fine at center. And David Edwards has been perfectly fine at guard in place of McGovern, who moved over to center. In fact, you might make a case that 2024, Connor McGovern is better than 2024, Mitch Morris. So not only did the Bills save money, but you can make a reasonable argument at this point that they actually upgraded there. Love that take. At Irma Gersh says, still say DeMar Hamlin is a liability versus the run and offers nothing in a safety blitz package. He's a good safety as a net safety, the positionally sound safety, the reliable safety, a Mark Kelso style safety, but long-term, I want an upgrade. Uh, I'll tell you what, I mean, that's not the kindest uh, explanation or being detailed with DeMar, but it's very reasonable. I don't think that's wrong. I never really thought of Mark Kelsey in that way, but sure. Yeah. Look, Dem <laughs> one thing I've noticed on Twitter, especially, or not just Twitter, Facebook, probably blue sky. Once I get on there more and stuff, the DeMar Hamlin support amongst Bills fans is divided like crazy. Like, 
I'm talking Republican versus Democrat politic divided. Like there ain't no in between. Like people either defend Demar Hamlin vigorously on every single play, no matter what happens. You know, there's a couple plays maybe throughout the season where there's just no defending him. But outside of that, there's plays he could have made. He didn't. People are just going to defend it no matter what to go to the end of the year to defend him. Or on the other side, there are people that hate Demar Hamlin like beyond rational. It's just beyond reason. And it, it's just weird to me. My take on Demar and has been very vocal about it both ways. I thought he was pretty lousy as a starter for the first month or so of the season. And you all know about the aftermath of me being vocal about that. I don't want to get into that today. But I've also thought over the last four, five games now, I think DeMar Hamlin has ranged from perfectly fine to, to good at times. So sure, to me, DeMar Hamlin has a high floor and a low ceiling. So when I think of that, high floor, he's not going to kill you. You could do worse than him, but a low ceiling, like, this is probably as good as he can get. Like if DeMar Hamlin was the Bills starting safety for the next 12 years, this is the level he will continue to play at. Sound safety, sound tackler, not going to make a lot of mistakes, but he lacks the athleticism to make up for mistakes. He's not going to make a lot of plays. Although he's had two interceptions this season, albeit gifts, a fumble recovery, right place, right time. So it's not like he's incapable of making a play, but dad, just generally speaking, I think he's a high floor, low ceiling dude. So when you say that that way, Mark Kelso is actually a really good cop. Demar Hamlin is the present of the Buffalo bills. Cole Bishop is the future of the Buffalo bills period. It kind of leads into uh, one of the last takes here at bills are electric. When will we see our second round pick Cole Bishop on the field? Maybe he could be defensive player of the week in week 16. That's a joke because I said, uh, you know, on social media, the, after Bernard won the third defensive player, I said, well, when Milano wins it in week 17, that'll be four. So his his his, uh, his quip there is of how Cole Bishop winning it in week 16. But anyway, he says, P.S., if our second round pick had been a receiver, running back, or a defensive end and was not playing, I bet fans would be calling him a bust already. All right, just like I said a minute ago, bar an injury, Demar Hamlin is starting. It's 11 games in. I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, I thought all along that the Bills would reach out and maybe sign Micah Hyde. This is the first time I don't feel that way. We're already getting into Wednesday night and the Thursday. The Bills are on their bye. So if they're not signing Micah Hyde now, when are they? The answer is they're not. Well, maybe they do if there's injuries. Again, I said barring injury. Um, Cole Bishop just hasn't played enough. He hasn't earned the trust of Sean McDermott. He did get one start against Houston because uh, Taylor Rapp was out and it didn't go well. The Bills are giving you letting the Bills have let one receiver this entire season get behind him for a long touchdown, and that was Nico Collins. And when they played in Houston. And Cole Bishop was at least partially responsible for that play. I'm not the least bit down on Cole Bishop whatsoever. I'm quite excited about 2025. I do think he goes into camp. Let's just say DeMar's back because he'll still be under contract. And Cole Bishop's back. I think Cole Bishop is your starting free safety alongside Rap in 2025. But this season, no, he's not playing this year unless he has to. If they have multiple injuries, he's got to get out there. Or one injury, he's got to get out there. Yes. But if Damar and Rap stay healthy, and at this point, trust me, you hope they stay healthy, you're not going to see Cole Bishop unless it's special teams. Uh, Dean J. Timmerman, Timmerman says, I would still put a call in the free agent to Jamal Adams as a hard-hitting rotational safety. Not a chance. Thanks for the comment, Dean, but no. Nope, 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 nope. Do not want that. No good. Not, not a good player. Not a good fit. If you're going to do that and you want to have a blitzing, hard-hitting, rotational safety, basically a linebacker, the Bills got one on the practice squad and his name is Lewis Sign. So, hell, you'll call Mike a Hyde if you have to, if you get into big safety depth trouble. But no, no chance. Jamal Anderson. 
Uh, at Brian Fack at Blue Sky Social says these Thanksgiving games, including Black Friday, may subject to us to some of the least interesting holiday games ever. I gotta disagree with that, man. Um, schedule so Thursday is Chicago at Detroit early game, Giants at Dallas. I agree with you there. That's your dinner game, and then Thursday night you got Miami at Green Bay, and then Friday your Black Friday game, which I can't believe there's a Black Friday game, but sure. Vegas at Kansas City. Again, generally, I, I disagree. You know, that Giants-Dallas game, that sucks for sure. I mean, that's going to be, we talk about DeVito against Cooper Rush. What a hell of a matchup that's going to be, man. Two teams going nowhere. But Detroit's fun to watch. Chicago's at least capable of making that a fun game. They got some fun players on that team. Miami, Green Bay, those are, you know, lots of good players, good offenses. Rooting interest. If you're a Bills fan, you obviously want Green Bay to win that game. And then, yeah, Friday, probably not going to be a, a good day for the Vegas Raiders. But, hey, the Chiefs are playing. They are, you know, you, you got something to root for, something to, to hope for, at least anyway, if you're a Bills fan. So, don't agree with you there. Uh, let's see here. I think we got, what, two more? At Mr. Ghostface85. Eric Wood is one of the best drought-era players. Oh, Sure. Yeah, no doubt, man. Um, and he's doing great things here now as well. He's gotten so much better at broadcasting on the radio. Like, he sounds polished now. He's put it together. You know, we talk about Josh Allen putting it mentally together as a quarterback and seeing things and knowing things. I think Eric's getting to that point now with broadcasting, just that comfort and confidence level. Um, he works hard at it. He works hard at doing that just like he did. Uh, when he was the center for the Buffalo Bills. Dude loves the team, loves his job, loves the city, loves the people. So, yeah, man, sure. Great. Uh, one of the best drought era players, one of the best players, period. One of the best dudes, uh, period. At Nathan Dane says, I get upset. Actually, I lied to you. I got two here. Two left. I get upset with all the Sabres talk. Uh-oh. And <laughs> your responses to my issue and said, oh, this, all right, this is uh, my bad. Let me start that over. I'm going to change my tone here. This is from a YouTube subscriber who's not happy when I have non-Bills content on the show. Nathan says, I got upset with all the Sabres talk and your response to my issue and said I would desubscribe and leave. But I'm here to say I've resubscribed because ultimately I like your show and I'll try not to be so reactive in the future. Go Bills. Thank you for that, Nathan. I, I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, look, I hope you don't get too reactive in the future because there's going to be non-Bills content from time to time. Probably more and more in the future as I start to put together some projects. But I'll tell you, someone else mentioned too in the comments section on the video side, putting chapters together. Like on YouTube, you could have chapters. And if you got non-Bills talk, because I do, again, I'm not naive. I know where the bread is getting buttered here. It's Bills talk. But if I'm going to have a segment with the Sabres or I'm going to be small talking with my guests about bullshit around the holidays or whatever, movies, entertainment, you could put together, it takes five minutes, put some chapters together and kind of give the, the people who are watching an opportunity to skip through if they want. Of course, if you're listening to this on the audio side and I start going down the road to the Sabres, you just hit that 15 or 30 second skip button if that's what you want to do. But anyway, I do appreciate you uh, coming back to uh, the show and subscribing. All right, last one here. P Muni 59 at Blue Sky Social says, there's a hot take that maybe no one would want to hear. Sell the team. That's from the fans. Terry sells the team, but the new owner says no to Buffalo and moves them. That is my fear with us wanting for Terry to sell. I just feel that's never talked about because it absolutely can happen. So it's clear, and Phil did make it clear in a follow-up uh, with me that he was all about the Sabres and not the Bills. But his fear is that fans want Terry Bagula to sell the team because they're Brutal to watch sometimes, man. And it's frustrating. And we're headed towards a 14th year. Don't get me going. Not going to do it today. Not going to do it today. In fact, that's kind of why I wanted to take the show before they 
go on the road later Wednesday night and play in LA. But anyway, his mindset, his fear is that you sell the team, sell the team. Well, Terry sells the team and he sells it to somebody who's going to ultimately get that team out of Buffalo. And then the Sabres don't have a hockey team anymore in Buffalo. I haven't really thought about it much because I don't see Terry Bagula selling, but it is a fair point. I would like to think that Terry Bagula, if he did decide to sell the Sabres for whatever reason, and he might sell a chunk of them, a piece of them, kind of like the bills are going on right now, but just to entertain your notion here, selling a majority or the complete team in its entirety, I don't think Terry Bagula would do that. And if he did, I would like to think that he wouldn't sell to anyone who wasn't going to guarantee that the team would remain here in Buffalo. And I especially feel that way as long as he's the owner of the Buffalo Bills as well. Like, I know a lot of Bills fans out there don't give a shit about the Sabres. I get it. But there's a lot of Bills fans out there who do also care about the Sabres. You know, it's not against the law to be a fan of the Bills and the Sabres and care about both teams. It doesn't have to be, and it's probably not 50-50, but you can care about the Bills and care about the Sabres. There would be a revolt against Terry Bagula if he sold the Sabres and they moved and still owned the Bills. So I don't see that. Fans would hate him forever. But if something were to happen to Terry Bagula, God forbid, though, who knows what that succession plan is? I don't know. We don't know. So that unknown scares me. Obviously for the Sabres, but maybe the Bills too. I know they're locked into at least now with the new stadium and stuff like that for quite a while. But even if you just want to limit it to the Sabres, if something happens to Terry, I don't know. We don't know. So it's a good point. Scary. Good point. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this pod bag. I said to myself mentally, I'm like, you know, 30, 35 minutes would be good. And here we are, like always, where Pat is almost at a, a full hour. This was fun. There's some good questions, some good comments, some good takes, hopefully for you guys, some, some good talking points and discussion here. Anyway, I'll be back one more show for the week on Friday. I got something brewing here. I expect to have a guest. And there's a good chance that I will actually be doing it somewhere on location as well. We'll see how that plays out. But anyway, thank you again one more time. If you have not yet already subscribed, please go ahead and do that right now. Audio, video, whatever you do, or both preferably, it really helps us continue to grow the show. You can follow me on several social media platforms. And I'll be back with one more episode, brand new one, tomorrow.